I went on duty at 6 a.m. up at the castle here. 9 to 9.30, Lord Mountbatten and his family came out from the castle and informed us that they were going down to the pier. So we got into a patrol car and we escorted them. In this unique photograph taken just 24 hours earlier, showing the family and staff outside Classybourne, all the members of Lord Mountbatten's boat party are present. His son-in-law, Lord Brayburn, and his daughter, Patricia. Their 14-year-old twin sons, Timothy and Nicholas Natchbull, and their 83-year-old grandmother, Doreen, the Lady Dowager. The only non-family member on board was the 15-year-old Northern Irish boat boy, Paul Maxwell. The day itself comes to me in flashes, rather like small explosions. I remember distinctly sitting in the library with my brother. My grandfather and the others had gone out of the boat, and Ash and I were watching on this crackly, fuzzy television screen, Lauren Hardy. On that day, the 27th, of August 1979. I was sitting on the back patio with Paul's father and Aunt Lisa. Paul said, goodbye, Mum, see you in the evening. I didn't think that was the last time I would ever see him alive. Beautiful morning it was, sun was shining. They left Mullockmore Pier and travelled out to where they had some lobster pots. This is where we were. Yes, looking out, you could see the boat as it came along. Dennis Devlin was a 15-year-old whose family came to Mullach Moor every summer. Their caravan was parked just off the coastal road. <laughs> As they come in, I could hear them talking. Talking among themselves. As the boat pulled up, I remember the young fella over the side of the boat pulling in the lobster pot and slowly pulled it in. The boat had turned round towards me and I was just watching it and I knew it was Lord Mountbatten's boat. The next thing, everything was screwing up under there. Everything just goes up and the news was exploding. Suddenly there was a flash of light and a loud bang. And you could see the boat had just disintegrated. It was obvious that a bomb had gone off. There was a mighty bang, a huge crack like thunder. And I immediately said, Paul is dead. And I knew he was dead because I felt a part of me go. My brother's sister and I were taken into the study. And before anything, we were asked to take these pills with a glass of water. I'd never taken a pill in my life before. And that, to me, was more surprising than anything of that day. I couldn't understand why I was being made to take a pill. Again, I think it's so reflective of the era that they were in, in the 1970s, that you would, someone would have had Valium on them, for God's sakes, and said, let's give it to the children. I mean, dear God, would you give an 11-year-old a Valium? I, for some reason, left the castle and ran down to the beach, which wasn't helpful at all, um, and incredibly inconsiderate of me now, I look back. I remember sitting on the rocks down at the beach, 
in my mind going over 27th of August, 27th of August, and I kept saying 1979, I'll never forget this date. And I don't. I don't. Every year that date comes around and, and we remember it. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and it was just such an incredibly beautiful day. And on the rocks, this incredible view. Um, and yet, you know, destruction. I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't normally get upset. <laughs> I remember it very vividly, every, every moment of it really, from the very start to the very end of the day, and I think I'll always remember it. Lord Mountbatten's boat had exploded. So immediately I got two friends and we went out on the boat to see what we could do. And um, we arrived there and those other boats that were in the near vicinity, they were already lifting the survivors. And at what point did you realise that Mount Batten himself had been killed? I think when, when we actually took him from the boat that he'd been brought ashore in and uh, brought him to the ambulance. That's the first that I realized that he had actually been one of the fatalities. He, he was one of the first who was actually taken ashore. It was a perfectly ordinary day, that August bank holiday. I was helping to put together the lunchtime bulletin for Radio Ulster. ...from the rescue helicopter. I was placed into the water beside what looked like the bubble of an anorak. I placed my hand and pulled it, and it didn't yield very easily, and I pulled it a second time, and it was then the head come up with the jacket as I pulled, and I realised it was a child. Imagine what those thick Aran sweaters must have felt like clogged with oil and water being lifted out of the out of the ocean and you know how long had Nick been floating in the water, you know. It was the first child that I handled in death. It came as a, a terrible shock to me, I can tell you, but I'm in rescue mode. I need to get him out of that water. I need to give him over to his family. 14-year-old Nicholas Natchpool's body was returned to Mullochmoor Harbour. It's uh, the last photograph we have of Paul. That's Paul. And that is Nicky and Timmy. So one boy survived and the other two were killed. He survived because he was up on the roof. Mountbatten was in the middle between Paul and Nicky. And so they got full blast. Later that afternoon, I had a phone call from a contact I knew within the Republican movement who asked, most unusually, to drive up to the Falls Road to meet him. Opened the door, he got into the car, sat down beside me, we drove on. Then he reached into his mouth, like that, and drew out a small scrap of paper which was wrapped up in cling film, unwrapped it, and this was the a telex message which contained the IRA claim of responsibility for, as they put it, the execution of Lord Mountbatten. The choice of the word execution is very deliberate. It is an attempt to imply that there was some kind of a justification. Execution uh, implies a judicial process, clearly, you know, absolutely inappropriate. By killing Mountbatten, you sent ripples around the world in a way which probably no other assassination could have achieved. While people were still reeling from the news that a member of the royal family had been killed at Moloch Moor, the IRA's operations that day were not yet over. Now the British Army was in their sights. Later that afternoon, over a hundred miles away, members from another South Armagh unit were lying in wait by the Newry River on the southern side of the Irish border. 
They were hoping to blow up a British army convoy traveling along the road from Warren Point across the river in Northern Ireland by detonating two radio-controlled bombs that they'd planted earlier. One, a 700-pound device hidden in a lorry piled high with straw, was parked in a lay-by. The other, a thousand pounds worth of explosive, hidden in a nearby gate lodge. Traveling down, I remember messing about with a car behind us. Tom Cochy was a local boy from Newtonards who had joined the parachute regiment at 18, as his father had before him. That day, he was a passenger in the lead vehicle of the two truck convoy. We had a packed lunch and we had oranges, and we made little teeth out of the orange, you know, and there was a, a car with a lady and kids in it. And we were smiling at them, you know, that type of banter. Ten minutes later, we were blown up. Not a bang, just a rumble. And I had the sensation of flying. Coming, not, not even coming to, just looking about, sitting there, and everything's just a mess. I came into the roundabout and you couldn't see past the roundabout, totally obscured with smoke. Peter Malloy was a freelance photographer at the time, who just happened to be passing. I got out, grabbed the cameras, and just as I'm going into it, a policeman's coming and running out, and he's screaming. He says, you know, don't go in there, they're all dead. I just put the camera into autofocus, and I just shot generally. The first thing I saw was a long wheelbase jeep and there were soldiers in that and one look told you they were they were obviously dead. And the heat, you couldn't really go too close to it. Everything was burning. And my legs were on fire. No, I couldn't move. And the next thing, the guys were on me. They were pouring water, you know, trying, trying to put me out. And one of the guys, uh, Give me his red, red berry to put over my face to keep it, the sun off it. And I can remember lying there and voices. Dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And voices getting closer to me. And whether I imagined this or whether I don't know, but it, I feel we remembered. I remember saying, I'm not dead. You know, and taking the berry off, you know. It was like a roll call of the dead. Seven of the nine paras traveling in the first truck had been killed. Tom Cochy, along with his friend Paul Burns, were the only survivors. But the carnage didn't end there. A very fine English voice shouted, there could be a second bomb, take hard cover and they all went over towards the gate lodge. Across the river, the IRA bombers were lying in wait, ready to detonate the second bomb. They'd predicted correctly where the surviving British troops were likely to regroup. I remember getting put in that chopper and Paul Burns being put in. I remember looking at his face and he was like something out of Tom and Jerry when the cigar goes off in your mouth and your face is black. And with all little, he was like a straw man, little bits of straw stuck in his face. And then, boof, bang, it goes again. Boom. I was thrown back and I got up again and it was over. Basically, it was over. The 27th of August had started badly for Mike Jackson. The news came through of the Markmore bombing and the death of Earl Mountbatten, amongst others, which was obviously very shocking. 
Now, as the news broke that his fellow paras had been ambushed at Warren Point, Jackson himself was called into action. The brigade commander looked at me and said, Mike, what are you doing here? You go down to the site, secure it, and take on all the aftermath. And so I gave out some rapid orders um, and, and got on the first light helicopter I could. There's no communication. All telephones are cut off, so you're waiting for word to come back from your own, from your own lads to what actually is going on. Is there a bit of you thinking, that's my mates? Yes, absolutely. And you want to know who it was because you know that some of your mates were being killed, were killed. So yes, you did want to know. Dead, 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 dead. Dead. A further 11 British soldiers had been killed in the second explosion. I get to Warren Point and um, it's a pretty grim sight, as you can imagine. There were body parts um, pretty much everywhere, and the trees were everywhere. Um, and uh, those who had survived um, were in shock. It was absolutely obvious right from the earliest point that this was a death toll on an exceptional scale. It transpired, of course, that 18 soldiers had lost their lives, the greatest single loss of life that the British Army had uh, suffered in Northern Ireland. Theirs were not the only lives lost that afternoon at Warren Point. Barry Hudson had been getting ready to go to work at the family's funfair business in Omeath on the southern side of the border. He had been joined that summer by his 29-year-old cousin from England, Bill. All of a sudden, we heard this thump, right? And um, I remember Bill saying, oh, what, what was that? And I said, it sounded like a bomb. He said to me, could you bring me down? Let me have a look. In the mayhem following the two bomb blasts, the surviving paras spotted the figures of Barry and his cousin Bill on the other side of the river and wrongly imagined them to be the IRA bombers. I see the lorry burning, one with the hay on it. For time, you could see the soldiers coming in along the road there in the jeeps. You see the red berries and that, you know, and... I heard the ground being struck. And then I felt my arm like a stone hitting it. I thought it was something of stone, maybe, or whatever. And it was bleeding. And then there was more. So... So I turned and Bill was standing over there. And the car was just parked up there and he was standing to the right, we'll say. And uh, I shouted at him then to get down. And then you could hear more guns and branches cracking and that. So I ran, ran like hell. <clears throat> and zigzagged up that lane. I've seen it in war film. I always thought it was a load of baloney, really, because uh, you couldn't escape that. But I did. Then it all stopped, dead quiet. So after about a minute or two, I thought my cousin should be coming up now. I, I just thought he'd get up and come back up. I looked around the corner and um, I seen him lying on his back and uh, blood. A lot of blood. And um, 
I, uh, I ran down to the car. I knew when I seen him, it's nothing, nothing anyone can do for him. The lad pulled the trigger, I'm sure he was shell-shocked, wasn't, didn't enter his head for one instant, you know, not to pull that trigger. And uh, I think they, we would all have done the exact same thing in that situation. It was left to Barry to report the tragic news to Bill's father. Ironically, Bill Sr. worked in Buckingham Palace as one of the Queen's coachmen. I said, oh, terrible news, Uncle. I said, Bill's dead. Oh, dead? Huh? What happened? How'd he dead? And I said, he got shot. How'd he get shot? Terrible. Terrible. Just one of the worst moments of my life, actually. Something I wouldn't want anyone to have to do. The army later acknowledged that Bill Hudson was an innocent civilian, mistakenly killed. This multiple killing, the worst the security forces have ever suffered in Northern Ireland, coming as it does after the Mountbatten tragedy, must serve to only further heighten tensions in Northern Ireland. Word quickly spread of how meticulously planned the IRA operation at Warren Point had been. Anthony McIntyre was an IRA volunteer locked up at the Mays prison at the time. I thought it was impressive. I thought it was ingenious because not only did they detonate the first device, they had to wait until the British Army backup arrived and positioned itself behind the gate post and then detonated the, the second one. So it took nerves of steel for the volunteers to sit there and do that. It was absolutely militarily fantastic. Brilliant. I don't want to say the word fantastic, but, you know. But the big bonus that they had that they didn't normally have was they were in a different country. They had no need to run away. Yeah. They were in the they south. They were in the south. And that's why they could take their time. You take advantage when you can, and, and they did. Will you please stand still, and I will move. The attacks on Lord Mountbatten and the British soldiers made a deep impression on Mrs Thatcher who had been Prime Minister for only four months. Within 36 hours, she landed in Northern Ireland on an unscheduled visit to investigate what had happened and to offer reassurance. When she went to Northern Ireland, I remember the walkabout in the shopping mall, um, which I thought was an extremely brave thing to do. Not because there was much risk of being shot in that environment, but simply because there would be a lot of people in the shopping mall who didn't like it very much. She was a very feminine person. And it's like the world, just you know. Yes, basically. She was profoundly moved. She didn't blub, but tears came to her eyes. It could have been a lot worse. She only very rarely wept, um, to my knowledge anyway. Um, and when she did, there, there was good reason for it. She's not everybody's cup of tea, I know that. But she was able to relate, and they to her, to the soldiers. Bodicea, very doughty lady. I think in terms of significance for Margaret Thatcher, knowing as we do what we do about her personality, I'm sure that it actually made her even more determined to resist. Mrs Thatcher's flying visit did not extend to the scene of the Mountbatten bombing over the border in the Republic of Ireland. Here too, the events of that day had made a huge impact. While it was recognized that the IRA had pulled off two audacious military operations, in PR terms, 
opinion was divided. Almost everybody spoke with regret and shame about what had happened to Mountbatten and that sense, this is our territory, how dare they do this on our territory. But there were a number of people, I won't say a majority, but there were a number of people who said what happened to Mountbatten was wrong. But as far as the British soldiers are concerned, listen, those that live by the sword die by the sword. This feeling was reinforced by the fact that 16 of the 18 British soldiers killed at Warren Point were from the paratroop regiment. The paras were deeply unpopular on both sides of the Irish border, thanks to an infamous incident that had taken place seven years earlier. There is no other single incident in Northern Ireland that unites nationalists of all colour, north and south, like Bloody Sunday does. Because to us, it was the deliberate killing of peaceful protesters on a march in Derry. 13 civil rights protesters were killed on what came to be known as Bloody Sunday. Here was the British Army turning its guns on the people it called its own citizens. And the soldiers responsible for Bloody Sunday were the paratroopers. So there was a particular feeling of, of general dislike towards the paratroopers. This dislike was felt particularly strongly by the IRA volunteers locked up in the May's prison at the time. And how would you characterise the reaction of you and your fellow prisoners to hearing about the Warren Point news? Exuberance, acceleration. Uh, all our Christmases had come at once and come early. The IRA couldn't believe their luck. For the nationalist population, we were monsters. We were quite ruthless, quite, quite callous, quite indifferent to the suffering of, of the relatives and found the parachute regiment absolutely anathema. They were celebrating and of course they were. And, you know, had a good day. And doubly good in the sense, you know, with the memory of, for them, the memory of, of Bloody, Bloody Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, what's for the old saying come out, you know, 13 dead, not forgotten. We got 18 on my button. There's a port for you. Very good. was extraordinary. I think my grandfather had masterminded every moment of it, uh, understandably, and, it, and it, it, it ran to perfection. The whole family of Europe seems to be here. Lord Mountbatten's state funeral, the largest of its kind since Winston Churchill's, provided a vivid reminder of the personal nature of the blow dealt to the royal family. The girl that bears the name of India. Thomas McMahon was sentenced to life in prison, but no one higher up in the IRA leadership chain was ever held to account for the bomb. Somebody knew children get on that bomb. Not necessarily the guys who put the bomb on or the guys who made the bomb, but the people who planned it certainly knew about the children. And if they knew about the children and were quite prepared to go ahead and to sacrifice their lives in order to get Mountbatten, then it's a war crime. Although Anthony McIntyre has since fallen out with the IRA, back in 1979, he was still very much an insider. They'd given the political sensitivity around Mountbatten, 
in the fallout that the IRA leadership, the political thinking people in the IRA leadership would have anticipated. I would imagine that was a, uh, a, a decision taken at the most senior levels. Kieran Conway, who temporarily left the IRA in 1976, is in no doubt as to who was in charge at the time of Mountbatten's assassination. I've absolutely no difficulty in saying that in 81 when I rejoined, and I wouldn't have said that until Martin died, uh, that McGuinness was chief of staff. And your clear understanding was that he had been since 78? Yeah. Ultimately, as chief of staff, it would be McGuinness's responsibility, that operation. Yeah, that's right, too. Yeah. Oh, that's the way it works. I mean, if you're the boss, you're the boss. You take responsibility for whatever goes on. Meanwhile, no one was ever put on trial for the bombs at Warren Point, let alone convicted, despite the arrest on the day itself of two IRA suspects near the scene of the carnage. Well, of course, it's frustrating. The offense is one of murder mass murder, and um, it is a source of great regret that nobody was brought to account for it. In these past few days, the irresistible force, the political will, has met the immovable object, the legacy of the past, and it has actually moved it. It took another 20 years after the Mountbatten and Warren Point killings, but peace was finally established in Northern Ireland by the British and Irish governments at the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. This agreement is good for the people of Ireland, North and South. As part of the peace process, the IRA's prisoners were released, including Thomas McMahon, the sole IRA member convicted of the killings. The idea of reconciliation has lain at the heart of the peace process. And there we get a first glimpse of the Queen. In 2012, the Queen came face to face with the man said to have been ultimately responsible for the assassination of her second cousin. You really did have to just pinch yourself and think can this actually be happening, that the head of state of the United Kingdom and the man who, without doubt, was one of the leaders of the military, the offensive side of the Republican movement, who may well have had a hand in planning Mullochmore or, or certainly signing off on it, that they were standing together was remarkable. The symbolic strength of that shaking of hands was enormous. Uh, it was one of the most powerful things she could do. And she did it even though, personally, it may have cost her something. But it was terribly important that that was done. Only she could do it, and she did it. She's a more admirable person in the transaction, I think, you know. Um, I think it was uh, more difficult for her uh, than for him. Like mother, like son, Three years later, the Prince of Wales made his own gesture of reconciliation. The events of 1979 had come as a double blow to him. He was Colonel-in-Chief of the Parachute Regiment, which had lost 16 of the 18 soldiers killed at Warren Point. And at Moloch Moor, he'd also lost the mentor who meant so much to him. At the time, I could not imagine how we would come to terms with the anguish of such a deep loss, since for me, Lord Mountbatten represented the grandfather I never had. The poet Yeats once wrote, and I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. As a grandfather now myself, I pray that his words can apply to all those who have been so hurt and scarred by the troubles of the past. Problem with peace is you have to keep working at it. It's not a passive thing. 
it is always going to be a continuing responsibility on all of us in these islands to make sure that the conditions in Northern Ireland do not encourage the breakout again of sectarian tensions. We do not want to go back to that. So it's not a matter of peace coming, dropping slow. Peace has to be worked at damn hard. Two years ago, Martin McGuinness, the man widely believed to have been the IRA chief of staff at the time of the bombings, died. According to Buckingham Palace, the Queen sent a private letter of condolence to his widow. Today, for the most part, normal life has returned on both sides of the Irish border. But the sense of shame in the village of Mullach Moor lives on, especially among those who'd had close ties to the Mount Battens. There was a terrible sense of shock in this village and disbelief. And there was a dark cloud over the area, over the village for years after. People didn't talk about it. They did in their own houses, hushed, talked and about it, but not out in the open. People felt so bad about what had happened and embarrassed about it. As with the town, so with the individuals themselves. They too are still struggling to come to terms with the tragic events of 40 years ago. I never took another picture since. It's 40 years ago. Why did you never take another photograph? I... I just couldn't face it. I was literally shaken. I watched the fireman and I thought that's what I should have been doing. And the following week, I applied and I joined the fire service then. Uh, loved it. Loved it. I see that young boy's face over and over, and it doesn't go away and it doesn't get any more blurred as it did from 1979 to today, because I can still see it. I'm okay with all that because I brought that kid home. That's 40 years ago now. Yeah. It hasn't been one day, I'm sure, that it hasn't crossed my mind sometime. And that's a long time for something to stick in your mind. Didn't feel lucky at the time. Didn't feel lucky for 10 years after. I wanted to be with them. Why did I survive? It was like a day that would never end. And then it went on to weeks that would never end and years where Grieving would never end, and it hasn't. I will always grieve for Paul. I carry him in my heart everywhere I go. I asked my mother about doing this, and, and she said, yes, absolutely, it's important to keep talking. I think in trauma and in death and in survival, there is so much that is unsaid, and there is, unfortunately, um, no path. There's no written textbook of healing. And so in amongst my seven cousins who I am, and remain close to, and my own siblings, everybody coped very differently. And some didn't cope well. And of course, we're seeing the side effects of that even to this day. And, and the damage that was done was so much deeper than any of us could ever have imagined. And adult lives are still being horrifically disrupted. I certainly try not to hold resentment in any way, and that's hard. But, but forgiveness, I think, is important. One has to move on. 
my brother, sister, and I were taken into the study. And before anything, we were asked to take these pills with a glass of water. I'd never taken a pill in my life before. And that, to me, was more surprising than anything of that day. I couldn't understand why I was being made to take a pill. Again, I think it's so reflective of the era that they were in, in the 1970s, that you would, someone would have had Valium on them, for God's sakes, and said, let's give it to the children. I mean, dear God, would you give an 11-year-old a Valium? I, for some reason, left the castle and ran down to the beach, which wasn't helpful at all, um, and incredibly inconsiderate of me now, I look back. I remember sitting on the rocks down at the beach, in my mind going over 27th of August, 27th of August, and I kept saying, 1979, I'll never forget this date, and I don't. I don't. Every year that date comes around, and, and we remember it. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and it was just such an incredibly beautiful day. And on the rocks, this incredible view. Um, and yet, you know, destruction. I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't normally get upset. <laughs> I remember it very vividly, every, every moment of it really, from the very start to the very end of the day, and I think I'll always remember it. Lord Mountbatten's boat had exploded. So immediately I got two friends and we went out on the boat to see what we could do. And um, we arrived there and those other boats that were in the near vicinity, they were already lifting the survivors. And at what point did you realise that Mountbatten no. himself had been killed? I think when, when we actually took him from the boat that he'd been brought ashore in and uh, brought him to the ambulance. That's the first that I realized that he had actually been one of the fatalities. He, he was one of the first was actually taken ashore. It was a perfectly ordinary day, that August bank holiday. I was helping to put together the lunchtime bulletin for Radio Ulster. Just from the rescue helicopter. I was placed into the water beside what looked like the bubble of an anorak. I placed my hand and pulled it, and it didn't yield very easily, and I pulled it a second time, and it was then the head come up with the jacket as I pulled, and I realised it was a child. Imagine what those thick Aran sweaters must have felt like clogged with oil and water being lifted out of the out of the ocean and you know how long had Nick been floating in the water, you know. It was the first child that I handled in death. It came as a, a terrible shock to me, I can tell you, but I'm in rescue mode. I need to get him out of that water. I need to give him over to his family. 14-year-old Nicholas Natchbull's body was returned to Mullochmoor Harbour. It's the, the last photograph we have of Paul. That's Paul. And that is Nicky and Timmy. So one boy survived and the other two were killed. He survived because he was up on the roof. Mountbatten was in the middle between Paul and Nicky. And so they got the full blast. Later that afternoon, I had a phone call from a contact I knew within the Republican movement, who asked, most unusually, to drive up to the Falls Road to meet him. Opened the door, he got into the car, sat down beside me, we drove on. Then he reached into his mouth like that, and drew out a small scrap of paper which was 